Welcome to the Data Science Institute's virtual seminar series. My name is Dr. Sarah Mackey from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Here at Lawrence Livermore, data science has become an essential discipline in many of our key program areas. LLNL is home to many challenging data sets, as well as home to some of the world's most advanced supercomputers. Our data science staff work in a variety of areas, including machine learning, artificial intelligence, big data analytics, statistical inference, predictive modeling, and uncertainty quantification. The Data Science Institute acts as a central hub for our lab's data science activities. We host events like this seminar series in order to introduce new ideas and potential collaborations to our laboratory staff. We invite speakers from outside the laboratory, from the Bay Area and beyond, to share their innovative approaches with our data science community. We are pleased now to include a wider audience in our seminar series through these recordings. You can read about past speakers at our website at data-science.llnl.gov or you can email us at datascience.llnl.gov. Thank you and enjoy the seminar series. So with all of that out of the way, I'm now uh, ready to introduce our speakers today, both internal to um, LLNL. We have Luke Peterson and Kelly Humberg giving a joint presentation. Um, so Luke uh, holds a doctorate and master's degree in astrophysical sciences from Princeton University. Uh, he joined LNL in 2011 as a member of the ICF program at the NIF. Um, and now Luke is an associate program leader for data science within the space science and security program here at LNL. And as part of that responsibility, he um, helps uh, develop a uh, the broad portfolio of projects at the intersection of data science and outer space. At LLNL, he's worked across several programs from ICF to stockpile stewardship to COVID-19 pandemic response and space science and security. His technical contributions in these areas span hydrodynamics, radiation transport, modeling and simulation, experimental design, digital engineering, UQ, uh, verification and validation, and the li list goes on and on with Luke. Um, so I'll go to Kelly now. Uh, Kelly uh, joined LLNL as a summer intern in 2016, and then in 2017, she became a Livermore graduate scholar and completed her PhD within the ICF program. And then in 2019, she transitioned to a staff member um, to a design physicist position. Um, currently, her work is focused on machine learning learning discovery and design for ICF and integrated hall room design. During her time at the lab, she's also worked in stockpile certification, technical nuclear forensics, machine learning accelerators for multi-physics codes, and briefly worked on machine learning analysis for the spread of COVID-19. And the common thread of Kelly's work has been the application of machine learning to science, uh, scientific problems with sparse data. Okay, so with two speakers, a lot to say up front, but uh, happy to have both of you here today. And I'll go ahead and turn the time over to the both of you. Okay, thank you. Um, it's Kelly down here. I'm Luke, uh, pleasure to be here. Um, so you may have heard that in December, uh, we got ignition, right? They're, they're t-shirts. I think they're handing them out outside. Um, you may have also heard as part of that uh, announcement that came out from Director Verdeel and from the subsequent um, uh, press conferences uh, and the like that uh, machine learning was mentioned there. The machine learning played a role in, make, uh, in, this, um, uh, in this grand, grand achievement. Um, and so questions came out, what exactly happened? What, what, it, what did the robots do as it were? And so hopefully today, uh, Kelly and I can help clarify a little bit and explain a little technically what was and what wasn't done um, around the ignition shot. So the pithy title uh, we're gonna show you today is Calling the Shot, How AI Predicted Fusion Ignition Before It Happened. Hopefully it's catchy enough to get you in here um, or, or virtually. Um, uh, but I will say that Kelly and I, we are just two members of a very, very large, large team that spans this laboratory across the country and really across the world. And this grand achievement is built upon the work of many, many people, an incredible team who've worked tirelessly for, for decades. Uh, for this specific uh, briefing, there are a few uh, groups we want to call out uh, big thanks to uh, Nathan Meason and Chris Young, who graciously let us take uh, a, I'm 
professionally borrow um, a bunch of their slides. Um, the hybrid E-team led by Annie Kreitscher and Alex Zilstra, who actually designed the shot that got us to ignition. Um, Brian Spears, who's been leading the cognitive simulation machine learning efforts and this vision for a number of years to get us to this point. Uh, the ICF Cogsim team, who did a lot of the work, uh, the driving design with Cogsim LDRD team and Project Ice Caps. There are too many of those to name, um, but if you're here in the audience in one of those teams, or if you're there virtually, you want to raise your real or virtual hand and, and we can kind of acknowledge you, that would be great. I see a few of you here, but you're all too shy to raise your hand, so um, talk to them later. So, uh, Ignition, you may have heard about it in the news, um, got a bunch of press about it, you know, nature, uh, we got ignition, what does it mean? Uh, US scientists reach long awaited nuclear fusion breakthrough, source say um, it's a, a bit on, on 60 minutes about it. My favorite press coverage came from these fine sources here, um, Saturday Night Live and, and The Onion. You know your career's really made it if you get lampooned by both SNL and The Onion in the same week. Um, uh, the Onion in particular is a great source of information on, on ignition and, and what it means. Um, they've got an excellent FAQ here uh, uh, in particular, you know, great questions like, why is this announcement so important? It's nice to see scientists succeeding for once. <laughs> so the big question is, uh, why all the hype? Why, why do we really care about this? Um, and really, the, the punchline is that fusion energy is the universe's energy source and the potential um, of harnessing that energy is huge in terms of a potential payout. A, a way to think about it is all of the world's energy reserves, you know, you could find that energy content in a cubic kilometer of ocean water in theory, if you could convert um, uh, the fuel in, in ocean water to, to energy via nuclear fusion. So, so that's kind of a big deal. Yeah, I'm seeing Dave Fox's eyebrows are going through like the roof over there. He's, that, that's incredible. And so because of this, uh, fusion has been a long sought after goal. Uh, in addition to uh, energy applications and fundamental science, because this is the process that goes on in, uh, in the stars, um, uh, a big driver and the, the driver for the ignition uh, effort, uh, NIF, is uh, stockpiled stewardship. Um, really, uh, ignition is a key part of the, the stockpiled stewardship mission uh, and our ability to maintain a safe, secure, and effective nuclear deterrent um, uh, in the absence of, of nuclear testing. So it's a very important um, thing there, and it's, it's fantastic. Uh, how do we get um, fusion energy? Well, nature does it via gravity. Um, we can't really fit a large star here, here on the planet, so there are two major approaches for doing things here on Earth. One is to use magnetic fields to confine the uh, hot plasma fusion fuel, and the other is the approach pursued here at NIF uh, is to use what's called inertial confinement. Uh, there are a number of types of inertial confinement, um, at, uh, indirect drive, uh, direct drive, and maglev, and so well, we'll kind of get into um, some of the, some of this a, a little, a little later. So this talk um, is broken up roughly into three parts. Um, I'm going to stand up here and talk about the shot, uh, what fusion is, what ignition is, kind of how we got here, set up the science problem. Uh, then I'll turn it over to Kelly for the really cool stuff and really why you're here. Uh, the call, the prediction, what was actually done. Um, and then uh, I'll stand up here and talk about the future and what this means for uh, the pursuit of ignition, um, the pursuit of high gain, and really uh, scientific discovery uh, in general. So let's dig into it. Part one, nuclear fusion and the National Ignition Facility. So fundamentally, when you have light atoms and they fuse together, they can release lots of energy. This here is a plot of the binding energy uh, per nucleon as a function of atomic mass numbers. So you have all the elements there. At the very top, you can see is, is iron sticking up there with that red dashed line. And so iron is very, very stable. Nuclear processes that take you from the right side of this chart to the left side of this chart, so for instance, uh, uranium, uh, is a fission process, splits into uh, smaller nuclei, and that difference in binding energy can get released as, as energy. Likewise, on the left side of the plot, you can have light, item, light atoms that can fuse together into uh, heavier elements, um, and that is energy gain from fusion. The primary reaction that we study here um, uh, at NIF is the DT reaction or deuterium and tritium. Uh, you can see a little cartoon of that here. So deuterium and tritium, these are two isotopes of hydrogen. Uh, they each have one proton in, in red, but they have different numbers of neutrons uh, in gray. Uh, if you can 
Get those two isotopes to fuse. They can fuse into an element of helium and release a high energy neutron. Um, the DT reaction itself uh, produces a lot of, uh, a lot of energy, um, you know, 10 to the three, 10 to the eighth megajoules per kilogram um, in contrast to 24 megajoules per kilogram from burning coal. So this, this nuclear process can release a whole bunch of energy, very, very high energy density. But how do you get fusion? You need a very, very hot and dense plasma. So take a solid, heat it up, melts to a liquid, heat it up, turns into a gas, keep heating it up. Eventually the electrons will strip off of the, the atoms of that gas and you'll get a plasma. That plasma will be able to conduct electricity. And it's very, very hot to reach these temperatures. Normally these two positively charged uh, uh, elements, they've got the, the protons in there, will repel each other. There's this thing called the Coulomb barrier, right? Opposites attract, but you know, likes repel. Um, if you can get things up to being very, very hot, uh, 10 kilo electron volts or 10 to the eighth Kelvin, you actually can overcome that repulsive barrier and get these uh, atoms to fuse together. Um, you can kind of look at uh, the chart on the right is a plot of the uh, reactivities of a number of different reactions. Um, this is the bigger it is, the, the more likely that reaction is to take place. Um, as a function of temperature, and you can see the DT reaction in that solid black line up there, peaking at about you know, 10, 10 kilo, tens of kilos of electron volts. Now, um, there's another criteria that we're interested in, which is the, the Lawson criteria, that if everything's happening at this fixed temperature of about 10 keV, you want the combination of, of density, that little N, and time, that little funny looking T, that tau there, um, to be above some threshold. This means that you need a hot plasma that has to be dense for a long amount of time. Um, and so at fixed temperature, we can kind of do that trade off between density and temp temperature, um, or density and confinement time, excuse me. So this kind of lays out the two fundamental approaches for achieving fusion here on earth. Um, on the left is uh, magnetic fusion, where we contain that plasma for long periods of time, perhaps tens of seconds. It's kind of a low density plasma. Um, for a total pressure of about atmospheric pressure. Uh, in contrast, on the right, uh, inertial confinement fusion really uh, it reaches very, very extreme densities um, for very, very short periods of time. So 10 to the minus 11 seconds or so. Um, and what that means is at these very, very high densities, you're getting pressures that are hundreds, billions of times atmospheric pressure. So very, very extreme uh, conditions. The basic idea of inertial confinement fusion is to compress a fuel to thermonuclear conditions. It starts off, you have some uh, laser or other driving beam impinging on a millimeter scale capsule of cryogenic fuel. So imagine you have a hollow sphere in yellow there made of some uh, material filled with some of this uh, fusion fuel on the inside. What's gonna happen is uh, as that outer surface uh, heats up, it's gonna start to blow off or ablate. And that uh, blowing off reaction will cause an equal and opposite reaction to push the inside of, of the capsule inwards. You can kind of think of it, if you look at the sort of, you know, I can get this little virtual laser pointer for people. Imagine this here is a little rocket pointing upwards, okay? It fires its engine down, that rocket's gonna lift up, right? Conservation of, of, of momentum. And imagine you have a rocket right next to it and it's pointing towards the center and one next to it, and one next to it, and one next to it, one next to it, et cetera, et cetera. And they all fire their engines at the same time, and they're all gonna crush towards the center. That's the basic idea. Well, as this thing crushes in, the uh, fuel in the center is gonna compress and heat up to thermonuclear conditions. You can think very, very extreme pressures, just like if you were to take a, a balloon, a water balloon, and try to squeeze it with your hands, it's gonna get to principal very, very high pressures if you can crush that all up. Um, and hopefully the idea is at the very center, uh, that fuel will reach the conditions where it will ignite um, and start a, uh, a thermonuclear burn wave that will propagate outwards from the center of that capsule and consume the rest of the fuel. Now the quest for inertial confinement uh, has really been a 60 year long journey. Um, ICF was born right around the invention of, uh, uh, of the laser. Um, there's a, a seminal paper by uh, former lab director, John Knuckles, uh, where they realized that, hey, perhaps you could use lasers to crush uh, a capsule to reach these conditions. A series of larger and larger lasers have been built over the decades, um, culminating in NIF, um, 
starting in the 2000 or starting in the 90s when groundbreaking happened, um, NIF beginning operations right before uh, I think it was 2009, um, and then finally up to ignition here. You'll notice that NIF coincides here with the emergence of science based stockpile stewardship. So the ending of uh, nuclear testing. Um, and really, there's a recommendation by the National Academy of Sciences that, hey, if you want to do this, um, achieving NIF and achieving ignition on NIF should be a high priority for national security. The principal concept behind ICF is that of an implosion, which is used to squeeze the fuel to high temperature and density, as I mentioned in that little cartoon. Um, here's uh, a little cutout of uh, John Knuckles' uh, paper in 1972. Now, one way of doing it is you could have the laser beams hit that shell directly, this is known as what's uh, laser direct drive, and this is the primary approach used by our colleagues uh, at um, the University of Rochester in the Laser for Laboratory Energetics, uh, LLE. Another alternative approach is to use uh, what's called indirect drive that adds what's called a polarum, which is a hollow cavity, um, to drive the capsule more symmetrically with x-rays. Go back to your, your mental picture if you've got this water balloon, you're trying to squeeze it. Now imagine the gaps between your fingers, right? If you're pushing kind of slightly harder on your fingers, the water balloon could squirt out of the gaps where you aren't necessarily squeezing in uniformly. The idea behind uh, indirect drive is instead of hitting the capsule directly with those laser beams, what you can do is fire them towards the inside of this uh, gold canister, this gold hole run here, and then think about an electric stove, okay? So as an electric stove gets hot, it's gonna start to glow, right? It's gonna start to go red, right? And then as it gets hotter, maybe it'll go, go white. Uh, if it continues to get hotter, eventually it's gonna glow in the x-rays. That would be a very, very hot uh, electric stove, but that's the idea here um, uh, at NIF. So what happens is this canister gets very, very hot, and it starts to produce x-rays. And those x-rays then hit the surface of this capsule, and that bath is very, very uniform. It's compared, much more uniform than the individual laser spots. So the idea is, as I mentioned before, that outer surface is going to uh, start to ablate, um, the shell is going to accelerate inwards, we'll reach a stagnation and burn, um, and then at that time, we've got this hot spot formed uh, in the center where the fusion reaction is happening, it's going to uh, ignite and burn up the rest of the cold fuel that's, that's surrounding it. This little cross section of, of what the thing looks like. Um, here we've got uh, DT vapor on the in, uh, inside, so vapor gas, and then actually a, a thin layer of uh, solid uh, deuterium tritium ice on the outside. So this is going to be you know, a fuel source for once we've ignited it, it's going to consume that. Um, I'm a simulation guy. We're here in this, you know, um, cool uh, LC room. Um, so simulations, I think, help me understand what's going on. This is a, um, a movie of a simulation of the whole process. What you see here is the lasers will uh, come in from, from the top and the bottom through these uh, holes here at the top. They enter through what's called the laser entrance hole. Um, and uh, it hits this uh, surface here, which will start to uh, release the x-rays and bathe this capsule that expands. And you're going to see now that it's going to accelerate and compress uh, inwards. You'll notice here, this is the laser pulse as a function of time for, for an older design. Um, newer designs would take about half as long or, or so, but we're talking 20-ish, you know, ten, tens of nanoseconds, right? This whole process. So 10 nanoseconds is very, very fast. Um, speed of light is about a foot a nanosecond. So this is faster, you know, 10 nanoseconds, faster than time it takes a beam of light to travel 10 feet. So here you are, you know, 10 feet away from me. The whole experiment is over by the time you see that I'm telling you the whole experiment is over. That's impressive, right? That's super duper cool. So how do you hear at um, uh, Livermore? The primary facility is, is NIF. Uh, here's kind of a cutaway of what NIF looks like. Um, it's about three football fields if you're to lay them one, two, three like this. Um, laser beams will travel back and forth uh, through these amplifiers, getting up to their very, very uh, high energy, and get focused here on the target chamber. If we zoom in on that, this is about 10 meters across, so pretty, pretty large, very impressive. Um, and at the very, very center of that, we've got this uh, hole room, the uh, indirect drive hole room, where the lasers are going to come in through the top and through the bottom. This is about a centimeter in, in scale, so think about like um, like a pencil eraser, okay, it's, it's the size of that. So you've got this, you know, huge, huge 
uh, all these lasers, so 192 laser beams, each one has a cross section, you know, maybe a foot or so, all of them being focused down to within this thing uh, smaller than a, about a pencil eraser. So incredible engineering and incredible precision, and I'm, I'm blown away every time I think about it. And then inside that, you know, talk about feats of, of engineering, you've got this um, two millimeter capsule inside there. So that's about the size of like a peppercorn, okay? Um, and they're exquisitely engineered. Um, surface is like 100 times smoother than here. Um, absolutely fantastic. Uh, we've got a bunch of diagnostics that um, have come online over, over the years that give us key insight to our experiments and really help build understanding over time. Um, we measure things like the total number of neutrons coming out, but we also take uh, images of it. Um, we take spectra. Um, a whole uh, array of really cool, really complex uh, diagnostics. So now, brief history of time. We can kind of look at turning points of how we got to where we are um, by looking at a plot of uh, total neutron yield per minute out output as a function of time. So uh, timeline there on the x-axis, on the y-axis is the energy in, in kilojoules um, uh, produced uh, by the experiment. Uh, and you can kind of see the first experiments happened in the kind of 2011-ish or so with, with uh, tritium. And what we realized is um, there was an original design that through the use of really uh, advanced modeling, um, 3D modeling and insight, we realized that uh, that design was, was less stable than we would like. So here are some simulations from uh, Dan Clark where you can see there's a lot of all this spikiness here going on. That, that spikiness is going to uh, really harm the reaction. But as you're trying to keep this thing smooth, as it implodes, if you've got these spikes of, of cold fuel or cold ablator material, they're gonna cool the reaction and you're not going to get the conditions that you want. Well, the, the team realized that was happening and kind of came up with a new design that was referred to as the high foot that was more stable. You can see a contrasting simulation on the right. And in conjunction with that, yields went up significantly. Another major turning point, now we've changed the y-axis on you, so the, uh, the old designs are kind of down here, was the um, ability to do this with diamond capsules. So to manufacture, the original designs were made with plastic capsules. Diamond capsules are cool for a number of reasons. One, you can kind of think about diamond uh, is very dense, right? So the speed of sound is fast in it. Because the speed of sound is fast, it means the whole process can happen faster. And because the whole process can happen faster, you don't have to kind of keep a thing under control for, for nearly as long. Um, this also allowed them to do things like reduce the uh, gas fill inside the whole room to reduce uh, laser plasma instabilities. Um, and because of those two combinations, improved symmetry control with a shorter laser pulse and the reduced uh, laser plasma instabilities, we saw a further increase in, in performance. Um, another uh, major evolution was the ability to um, manufacture these larger uh, diamond capsules. So this was increasing the uh, capsule size relative to the whole room, and this is more efficient. You can kind of think about it as, imagine you're standing out in, in a windstorm. It was super windy yesterday, right, at one point. Imagine you're holding up a, a piece of paper, right? And now imagine holding up like a gigantic sheet, right? Which one's gonna blow you over? It's, it's the huge sheet. So having a larger capsule is gonna have more surface area. So you have more surface area, you can have a more efficient uh, implosion, so you can couple more energy in. Um, so what the team was able to do was take advantage of this while maintaining symmetry control and achieve what was referred to as uh, burning plasma um, in, in 2020. Huge milestone um, in and of itself. We can kind of look at the change in in, uh, in y axis here. You know, these original low foot experiments are that kind of blip, right? And now we're talking huge, huge improvements. Um, Further improvements in holder efficiency and, and uh, an implosion design um, with these larger capsules led us to refer to the threshold of ignition. In uh, August of 2021, uh, they achieved um, uh, uh, the loss in criteria of greater than one, that, and um, a gain, which is the total uh, energy produced um, by the capsule over the energy the lasers put into the horum of 0.7. So this was really cool. Um, really fantastic and amazing, uh, amazing accomplishment built over, you know, now we're talking over a decade or so, a little longer. Um, 
And so they, they did that shot. And then there were some repeat shots that kind of happened in, uh, in 21. Um, and what, you, what we noticed is there was a pretty extreme sensitivity design. Then the repeat shots actually got up uh, to that original, original one. Well, so um, uh, the laser was able to uh, be upgraded to produce even more energy, put more energy in there, um, which allowed for slightly thicker capsules. Um, and uh, what that was able to do, a um, combination of that and extra symmetry control, it could drive the, the capsule longer. And the uh, hybrid E team, led by uh, Annie Kreitcher and Alex Silstra, were able to get this design up actually across that, that threshold um, in December. This past, this past December um, for a gain of about one and a half. So a little over two uh, megajoules of, of laser energy got on target and um, the uh, experiment produced a little over three uh, megajoules of, of energy. So that's a very brief history of time. You can kind of look at the achievement of you know, way up here compared to you can't even see what those first experiments are. Um, this has been kind of a, a fantastic journey built out over you know, a very, very long time. Um, Summary of history of kind of where we are is that it did take longer to reach ignition on NIF than originally envisioned, um, but now the original goals for both performance and inquiry can can be realized. Uh, I should mention NIF is not a fusion reactor, um, but it has demonstrated the fundamental physical principles necessary to pursue energy production, like lots of companies and stuff are are doing. Um, really, progress in inertial kinetic fusion has been made in incremental steps over 13 years as we've got. New diagnostics have come online, improvements in engineering control, simulation capabilities, target manufacturing, physics understanding. Um, and then we're in the process of kind of looking to, to repeat this. So a, a way of thinking about that is if you were to, you know, what you do next time, what are your ingredients for ignition? You want exquisite experimental facilities, engineering marvels, high performance computing and, and, and high fidelity state of the art simulation, um, physics intuition, understanding and learned experience, and an amazing team working tirelessly with the veterans. Um, so that's fantastic, but you know, you're probably sitting here. Well, this is a data science institute talk, right? You know, you just told me that the, the team kind of you know built it, built it slowly. Where, what about uncertainty quantification, data science, machine learning? You know, you had that silly title and that overly sensationalized abstract that got me to listen to this. Like, well, what's with the AI? You know, where are my robots? Um, so for this and for the really cool stuff, I'm going to turn it over to um, my colleague Kelly Humberg, who will take you through. How they called the shot. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here today and letting me get to tell this story. I think actually for the first time outside of the program, so it's it's exciting to walk through this. So how did how did we do it? What went into um, predicting this experiment before it happened? So I'm part of the inertial confinement fusion cognitive simulation team. Uh, I've been with them my entire career. Um, for several years, uh, we've been working on ways to develop tools and techniques to uh, do things like assess designs, um, you know, quantitatively evaluate design sensitivities, um, statistically calibrate our models with data, and more recently, um, figure out how to propagate model uncertainties uh, through to new scenarios to make uh, predictions with credible physics informed uncertainties. So that's something we were able to do for the first time in a very visible way uh, for this December experiment. Being able to do that actually relied very heavily on uh, the series of experiments we did after M210808. So that August 21, 2021 shot was the first time we'd achieved over a megajoule of fusion yield. That experiment produced about 1.35 megajoules. It was a really huge scientific achievement. Uh, we were so excited, the whole program shifted gears and decided to repeat that experiment a few times to assess how robust this design was. We found that it actually wasn't as robust as we might have hoped. Uh, the repeat experiments didn't produce as much yield. But for my team, this produced an amazing set of data. For the first time ever, we had repeat experiments of a NIF experiment and we could do real UQ in the way we've always wanted. So following this uh, M210808 experiment, uh, we conducted these uh, experiments called the variability series to assess the repeatability of the, this design on the ignition clip. 
So we've been using this set of experiments to answer some uh, really important questions, like what's the level of variability we should expect from future experiments at the NIF? And what drives this uh, observed variation in performance? What are the driving uh, degradations of our implosions that are causing our high performing designs to not perform so well? So, answering these questions are it's actually really challenging. Uh, there are multiple known and unknown sources of degradations in our implosions. Uh, they're often coupled and correlated. It makes it hard to decide what actually degraded the, the performance. These implosions are also uh, really sensitive and they respond highly nonlinearly to perturbations. And as much uh, as many diagnostics as we have at NIF and as much data as they provide for us, we still have incompletely diagnosed experiments. If we could directly measure some of the things uh, that we'd like to measure on these implosions, we wouldn't need to do statistical calibration of, of our models, but these things are really difficult to probe, so uh, we have to figure out how to grapple with this incompletely diagnosed data. So, after spending you know, over a year analyzing this variability series of experiments, um, we figured out how to learn what we used from those uh, experiments in order to try to make predictions about what we think will happen on future NIF designs. So, I broke this down into kind of a, a three part uh, series. Uh, our first step that we're going to do in order to make the predictions for the de December shot is infer the degradation mechanisms that we saw on the variability shots. Then we're gonna take uh, that inference and build a global variability model that quantifies our actual shot-to-shot -shot repeatability at NIF, and then apply this global distribution of shot-to-shot -shot degradation mechanisms to a new design and see how it performs under the perturbations we saw in the 210808 repeats. So step one, um, we're gonna take all of the great rich experimental data we acquired during the repeat series of experiments and use our machine learning surrogate models um, that emulate our expensive radiation hydrodynamic codes and statistically calibrate those models. So if you're familiar with the lingo, this is a very traditional Bayesian inference. We have our set of outputs that we measure at the NIF and we have a forward model. We have uh, Hydra is our, our simulation of choice for ICF implosions. Um, we have a model that maps us from our simulation inputs to our simulation outputs. In reality, it's a neural network trained on a bunch of Hydra simulations. So with this forward model, we can solve an inverse problem. We can MCMC sample, figure out what simulation inputs are consistent with our experimental data. So that's kind of what we're showing in this middle plot here. For each of the repeat series, we can infer simulation inputs that are consistent with the observed data. And then we have um, basically these, these distributions of input parameters that explain that data. Now, we can think of each of these individual colorful distributions as random draws from a broader distribution that is the NIF. So anytime we go to the facility, we're going to run an experiment and sometimes we'll get this red distribution, sometimes we'll get the blue distribution. They're all draws from a, a broader distribution. And we call that the global variability model. So this is a set of simulation inputs that if you were to draw from it, um, you expect to get outputs that are consistent with what you would see at the NIF if you were to repeat your experiments. So if we sample this global model and run Hydra simulations, uh, forward propagate them to the output space, uh, we get the purple cloud there on the, the far right. Uh, we're looking at neutron yield versus downscatter ratio. These are two important metrics for defining implosion performance. And we see our global variability model in purple captures the experimental data shown in the, the colorful little points um, very well. And uh, importantly, we're not just predicting yield in DSR, we're matching a whole suite of observables from these NIF experiments. So we can look at a few different uh, 2D projections of this distribution of expectations that we have when we repeat an N210808-like design. 
So the global variability model um, forms a distribution of input parameters that are degradations we expect our implosions to see when we go to the NIF and fire an experiment. We can take those simulation input parameters and use them as priors for predicting the outcome of a new design. So that's exactly what we did for this December shot. Um, we used that variability model to inform our prior assumptions for our pre-shot predictions for this new design. So uh, there's some details uh, on this slide that I don't think are necessarily super important. But we basically split our hydro simulation inputs into two different categories. Some are inputs that we think are basically constant or that we can predict. And this is often stuff that has to do with the design itself, like the drive. Uh, you saw an example of a laser pulse earlier. We're going to assume the laser pulse is delivered as we request when we're making these pre shot predictions. Generally, a good assumption. Sometimes uh, the laser delivery does vary. Um, what we are really concerned about with this study is the uh, sources of variability. And those are parameters that we're gonna allow to vary in this uh, set of pre-shot predictions. So for our model, these are things like uh, preheat of the fuel, which makes it harder to compress it to really uh, high density, a mix model that describes uh, stuff getting into our central hotspot and quenching the burn, and drive asymmetries. Uh, we talked earlier about trying to squish a balloon. You wanna squish it uniformly all the time. You have asymmetries in how you're squishing your capsule. It can lead to um, not as optimal performance. So we use these uh, input parameters we learned from the variability model. And then we actually um, go talk to the team of designers that are designing their experiment to see if there are any physics informed updates we should make to our prior assumptions about the specific shot. So leading up to the December shot, uh, we worked closely with Annie Critcher and the hybrid E team to decide, you know, what are the biggest risks for this implosion? What are things we're uncertain about? Um, we decided that there were two big sources of variability we might expect for this shot. Um, and that was uh, a mode two asymmetry, kind of if you're squeezing the capsule preferentially on the waist or on the poles. Um, that can end up giving you uh, an oval shape implosion at the end of the day. Um, and going into this shot, there was a lot of uncertainty about how, how round this implosion might be. So we decided to let our implosion shape vary. Um, we thought it'd be close to round, but have some spread of, of different outcomes. So that was actually uh, informed by our, by our variability series where we had mostly round implosions, but the shape varied by about seven microns in standard deviation. The other big unknown um, going into this experiment was how much mix there would be. We knew that the capsule wasn't as high of quality as 210808 and its repeats was. So we might expect more mix from this capsule, but some design decisions had been made in order to try to mitigate the mix. So we weren't sure which, which of these things would win out. So we decided to actually look at two different mix scenarios, one with a moderate amount of mix, one with a high amount of mix. Um, at the end of the day, when we ran the analysis, they basically looked the same. So the results I'll show use the higher mix scenario to be a little more conservative. So this table, along with our variability model, uh, gave us our prior distributions, the inputs that we're going to sample and forward propagate through our new design to get predictions for what we think will happen. So in order to forward propagate uh, our input parameters through a forward model, we need a forward model for the new design. Uh, earlier, I talked about doing things like MCMC sampling with this 210808 design. In order to do that, we had trained a neural network um, on the 210808-like design. And to do that, we had to generate tens of thousands of simulations. This is super expensive. It takes months to build the data sets. We didn't have that kind of time to make this prediction. We had a couple weeks to get it out. So we decided to pull another trick out of our hat and uh, Try transfer learning. It's something the team has a lot of experience with, but we've never used it quite in this way before. So we decided to see if we could get away with running just a few dozen simulations of the new design and transfer learn our old neural network. 
turns out that was a great idea. It worked really well. Uh, we were able to make a really good uh, forward model for the December design with just a few, a few dozen simulations. So we take those input parameters uh, that we formed with our variability model. We are gonna forward propagate them through our new neural network for the December design and make our prediction. So this next slide uh, is exactly what we sent out to program management uh, a few days before the experiment uh, happened. So we said that we thought uh, Repeats of N220919, so that was an experiment that uh, was the sister shot to the December shot. Uh, it wasn't as round as we wanted it to be, so December was an attempt to correct the shape of 220919. So we expected that experiment with corrected shape to get two to three times the yield of N210808, which again was our 1.35 megajoule shot. And we thought it had about a 50% chance of uh, producing more energy out than the laser energy put in. So 50% chance of more than 2.05 megajoules. There's some numbers here uh, you can look at to compare the December design to 210808. It obviously had a much higher probability of igniting. If we look at the plot on the right here, we're looking at our predicted yield versus DSR. Again, we saw a similar plot earlier. Uh, the orange cloud is N210808. Uh, and the blue is the December design. So if we even just look at the, the marginal distributions of the yield, we see that the, the December design had a significantly a higher probability of producing these 10 to the 18 neutrons. Um, so multiple megajoules of yield compared to 210808, which peaked in around 10 to the 17 neutrons. So this design looked very different under the lens of, you know, apply the same perturbations 210808 saw, see what happens. This design held up very well to those perturbations and had a very high likelihood of producing a lot of yield. And Modify the slide just a little bit to add the little yellow square there. That's where the experiment came in. So pretty well within our yield expectations, which was uh, very satisfying to see. Of course, we're not just predicting yield and DSR. We're predicting a lot of outputs at the same time. Uh, we also sent around these plots, which are just you know two D projections of different observables. It's Really nice is when you add the experimental data, you see that we were pretty consistent um, with a large number of, observable, of observables that we ex uh, measured on this experiment, um, which you know, just kind of gives us confidence that this, this new technique for um, predicting the outcome of these NIF experiments with these very data-driven uncertainties is, is a promising way to approach the problem of pre-shot modeling. So that's the story of how we made this prediction. We've done it again since, um, don't have slides on that, but we did another prediction for a January DT. Uh, we're similarly pretty close in our expectations and um, we're making a prediction for the upcoming shot uh, this weekend. So maybe you'll hear more about that in the future. With that, I'll turn it back to Luke and we can actually just talk about the future. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. So. What we see here, right? Um, human design, machine learning analysis of, of that design, right? Pretty, pretty cool. The obvious next step you might be thinking is, well, what if you could take that machine learning analysis and actually embed it into the design process itself, right? If imagine every possible design change, you then quantitatively were able to predict uh, the uh, probability of, of, of achieving an outcome, of achieving high yield. Right, and then from that automatically then pick a new design and evaluate that probability of achieving ideals. And then change it and find a new design, a new design and have the machine learning model and this um, uncertainty based analysis embedded into the design loop. That would be really cool, right? It would also take a boatload of simulations. Because now think every single design you're doing, you're going to have to have a good model that you can do statistics on. And then you have to pick a new design, right? Well, there's more. We're good at simulations, and we're getting a new machine, which will allow us to do a 
a boatload of simulations. Um, so as I said, that ignition shot had a gain of about one and a half and the analysis that Kelly showed uh, gave a little better than 50% chance of gain greater than one. So in other words, you know, ignition is just a start, right? We really need reliable high gain. We wanna go from a coin flip of gain greater than one to high gain all the time, right? Can you get gain of 10? Can you get gain of 20? Can you get that reliability up front? That expectation, the quantitative expectation based on your, your simulations and your existing experiments, get that from 50% up to 60, 70, 80, 90, 95%. You know, can you get into that region? And can you qualify these designs before you actually feel them, right? You know, can we, as, as I said, find design that can reliably achieve high fusion energy production? And can we, you know, rigorously qualify that before we, we feel that? That would be really cool. It's also really hard. Think like a designer. What what parameters can we possibly change? Right here's a cutaway of, of, of the horn and the capsule. Um, list out all the parameters. Right, you can change the laser. You know where they're pointing, what the pole shape is, the function of time, the, the wavelengths. You can change what the materials the horn is made out of, what it's shaped like. Uh, you can change the the gas inside there. You can play around with the capsule. You know how thick all these layers are. You know where you put the built material, like the, the geometries of it. You can easily come up with, you know. Tens, tens of parameters, right? Which is kind of a challenge. And furthermore, you know, we know that we really need high fidelity modeling. Ideally, we'd like to have mission relevant optimization with our, our highest resolution simulations, right? We wanna be able to run our, our super resolutions all, all the time. Um, but we can only really, perhaps we can only afford to run simulations down here, you know, lower resolution uh, simulations. And so how do, how do we optimize up here if we can only run down here and do so with optimizing rigorously dozens of parameters? This is super hard. Well, maybe X scale can help. Um, you know, we see automating this design as really the, the future that will allow us to explore larger design spaces, uh, look for new things, also let us rigorously define what we're looking for and, and defend what we found. Um, enabling new kinds of searches like robust design, right? Fold that probability uh, into it. And so there are two projects going on at the laboratory that are tackling some of these key challenges. Uh, there's a, an, an LDRD going on, the driving design with cognitive simulation, um, that is developing a lot of the tools and methodologies uh, to do so, and feeding that in partnership with Project ICECAP, which stands for Inertial Confinement on El Capitan, which the idea is to take that technology and put it on El Capitan. So we are really targeting the future is exascale design. We're building highly scalable simulation ability to run millions of simulations automatically, post-process and analyze the data, build the neural networks, launch, launch new jobs, search for new designs on the fly. Um, we're looking to exploit the advanced hardware features of, of LCAP to enable these automated and scalable workflows. We're building advanced surrogate models and neural networks that provide us meaningful uncertainty metrics that we can use for uh, optimization. Um, we're also developing optimization algorithms that work across these different fidelities um, to allow us to do um, phasing optimization up and down this hierarchy. So we're gonna test out some cool features on LCAP. Um, El Capitan is coming, NSA's first uh, uh, exascale computer. Um, exascale is kind of mind blowing if you think about it, right? So like a laptop, maybe like you know, gigahertz, right? <laughs> Giga, Terra, Feta. Excellent. It's like a billion laptops, right? Imagine if you could give everyone in the United States three laptops, hook them all up to one computer, and have them find a new NIF design. That's what we're going to try to do. That's super cool. Um, it's very exciting. Uh, we're uh, early on some of the early access um, hardware. We're testing out our, our, our key code, Hydra, try to get it fast on that new machine. Incidentally, we're also going to replace one of the expensive atomic physics DCA calculations with a machine learning model. So we're actually going to have a machine learning model inside the Hydra code itself. So our, our, our code's going to actually be calling a, a fast uh, running model inside. We're looking at enhancing some of the other algorithms with machine learning, um, and we're engaging with our partners to speed up the physics packages and also see how we can exploit uh, this um, new rabbit hardware, uh, these rabbit nodes for fast IO. Um, some of the new neural networks that we've been developing through the LDRD um, uh, are, are really cool because they're accurate even when data starved. Um, here's a picture of, of what it looks like. If you, 
and you think neural networks require a lot of data to run, but in some cases you might not have a lot of data. And if we have expensive simulations, you might not have a lot of them, maybe very sparsely populated at first. Um, but these new neural networks actually can do a very, very good job at recreating very complex data, even if they're pretty data starved. You can compare the new algorithms with some of you know, current neural networks that kind of smooth out all, all these features. Um, we've testing this out on, hydro, on, on optimization of automatically finding the designs. Um, and the punchline is what we found is that the combination of, of these new surrogate models or new optimization techniques uh, allow us to do in 50 to 100 simulations what we typically do with 10,000. So, um, you know, outperforming a bunch of other algorithms, including sort of standard like Gaussian process based Bayesian optimization, which is kind of the state of the practice right now. So, this is super cool because not only will we be able to run a bunch of bunch of simulations, we're also going to be much more efficient with the simulations we run because we'll be able to automatically hone in and only pick the designs that are, are promising. This is important because we know the design space can be pretty complicated. Um, you know, if you look at a low fidelity model of our, uh, so this is like a topographic map. If we're trying to find the, we're trying to find this region. So red is high yield with our high fidelity model on the right. But imagine we could only run low fidelity models. If we were to just naively optimize the low fidelity model and get this target, we would actually overshoot this high fidelity peak. So we've got a complex surface here we have to, we have to deal with. Fortunately, uh, this team's uh, super smart um, and they've come up with ways to build uh, surrogate models that can span across fidelities and actually share information uh, between them. Um, and if you have that information across these different fidelities, your low fidelity model and your high fidelity model, you actually can pick the right combination of low fidelity and high fidelities to run automatically. Um, I think the coolest way to look at it is just kind of a movie of the thing in action. On the left here is picking new simulations of, of low fidelity points. Um, and on the right is picking your, your expensive high fidelity models automatically. And what you'll notice is that as this thing leaps over, it kind of explores with the low fidelity model, you know, picking points and regions all around, but it's only spending its capital, its high fidelity model around where it thinks the, the peak is. So this, this, is, this is pretty cool. There's no human in the loop here, right? <laughs> it's, you know, figuring out which ones to run. And so this is, you know, running with the Gaussian process based model. Um, and we also have a, a neural network model um, as well that does something very, very similar, which is cool for the future and scalability. So, that's kind of the, the essence of our talk, these sort of three parts. In summary, on December 5th, 2022, an experiment at the National Research Facility achieved Bayesian ignition for the first time in history. Um, two megajoules of 2.05 megajoules of laser energy were used to produce about 3.15 megajoules of fusion energy for gain of about one and a half. Um, and this experiment building off more than second, sorry, 60 years of multidisciplinary R&D. Um, Kelly showed you that prior to the shot, uh, a team used a combination of statistical analysis, machine learning to quantitatively predict the outcome. Uh, that COGSIM model blends high performance computing simulations and experimental data with machine learning, tying the two of these things together. And they predicted that ignition was the most likely outcome with little better than a 50% chance of achieving a gain greater than one. And that's just the start. We're looking to now embed machine learning and certainty quantification into the design process itself. And we're gonna see what we can do on all that. So with that, uh, in addition to thanking all of you, I wanna thank again, this huge team that has worked uh, this laboratory and really around, around the country and around the world to uh, achieve this grand, grand thing. So thank you all. We're happy to take some questions. Sarah, we do have several questions in the chat. And some folks raising their hand. Okay, um, I think we can take a one question in the room and one question online. So, uh, would you like to share one of them from online with us? Um, well, we have a few that uh, other folks in the chat are answering, so I'm I'm going to skip those. Um, there is one that says, "What is the maximum theoretical yield for the standard capsule size?" Good question. So, if I recall correctly, and perhaps the folks online will answer better, I think this only used up about three to five percent of fuel in there. That kind of burn up fraction. So you, you factor of twenty. However, I believe the NIF facility is 
um, is where there's been like 20 or individuals, hopefully there are facility people yeah. online. Um, so you could think, you know, right now at kind of three megajoules, um, you know, 10 to 20 is I think what the current facility could handle. Um, I think there are discussions underway if we to upgrade if we could handle more. Um, but please correct me if you're a you know, facilities person on, online. Uh, someone's noted that the facility max is about 45 megajoules. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, right now um, we're kind of playing a partnership role with the design teams for these experiments, um, helping them make decisions. For example, like we have a shot coming up this Sunday um, that will be similar to the December shot. And there were some concerns over the, the capsules that we had available for the shot. So we assessed with these techniques, you know, the different capsule options and said, we think these two are probably the best two um, and helped make those kind of decisions. We haven't yet figured out how to efficiently put this tool in the loop for optimizing a design. That's kind of what Luke was alluding to as being part of the future. But right now we're helping them assess the designs that, that they're looking at. Um, Yeah, so the, the question um, was, you know, how many parameters do you think we could reasonably explore? And what are we targeting? Um, right now, the, the LDRD, uh, the Cogson LDRD and ICECAP are targeting kind of 30 to 40 parameters, which is enough to, to cover um, kind of the bulk of what you would need for the NIF, NIF I, I, ICF design problem. So that's kind of the range that we're targeting, which is a huge challenge. Um, it wouldn't be a challenge in, in regular optimization, right? There, there are folks. Um, that could do thousands of parameters. The challenge here is that the simulations are so expensive to do. So each simulation itself, you know, could take hours or days. Um, and so to tackle, you know, 40 parameters where it takes you that long to evaluate a function is what makes it so complex. But we're hoping to kind of get in that, you know, 30 parameter range. <laughs> 